of the Madison Astronomical Society. Um, I'm here, the president of the club, Lawrence Moore, and I've got uh, some announcements to go through before we start this evening's uh, gathering. First of all, um, I'd like to, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of go by chronological order. A week from tomorrow on Saturday, June 17th at 7.30 p.m., we are going to have our monthly star party at Yana Research Station. For those of us that joined us out there last month, we had an excellent uh, uh, excellent skies that night, and we had a lot of people show up, and it was a lot of fun. So hopefully, weather up permitting, a week from tomorrow night, we will be able to do it again. Um, if you didn't happen to catch this presentation at our uh, one of our recent Astronomical Society meetings, this Tuesday on June 13th at 7 o'clock, our own, very own John Rummel will be uh, repeating his uh, presentation, Protecting the Night, Light Pollution Reduction in Madison. And just a little bit of background, the Madison Council has actively been trying to get uh, dark sky certification for Madison, Wisconsin, which is really amazing. So if you want to learn more about that, stop here at Space Place at 7 o'clock for the monthly Space Place, UW Space Place guest presentation. Coming up on Saturday, July 8th, um, we are going to be having a... M or MAS, the return of the MAS picnic at Yana Research Station. Um, and I think for the rain date, we're going to tentatively do the following Saturday in case of bad weather. But we're going to get together on Saturday, July 8th for evening, an evening of food, good company, and stargazing, weather permitting. And if you joined us in the past, you know, if, if it's both good weather and the early evening and later evening when it gets dark, it's just a blast. I think yeah, we've had like 50 people there in the past. It was just a, it's been an amazing good time. So if, you, if you're available on Saturday, July 8th, we hope to see you out there. And as the event gets closer, we'll uh, give you a, other details. Our next meeting for the Madison Astronomical Society will be here at Space Place on Friday, July 14th. And we're going to have a guest presentation uh, entitled Teledyne Imaging, the largest camera, co camera company you have never heard of, presented by Chris Draves. And I do believe Chris has presented here in the past. Yeah, he did about 10 years ago. About 10 years ago, he did a, did a presentation on advancements <coughs> on digital imaging, and it was a great presentation. All right. And then one of the things that is coming up that's kind of new, on Friday, July 21st, with no rain date, we are going to have cocktails in the cosmos at Monona Terrace. For many of you might be familiar with our Moon Over Monona Terrace uh, event that we normally do every fall, um, open to the general public for free. This, however, is going to be a little different where being in the middle of summer, we can't get going until later because the sun doesn't set and you don't get astronomical twilight till like 10.30 to 11. So we're going to have an event that's basically going to run from 9 o'clock in the evening till midnight. And to keep uh, people having fun, we're also going to feature cocktails for all the guests. And also a, a kind of a opening introduction, we're going to have kind of a new thing. We're still looking for some volunteers to run telescopes and a few volunteers to kind of uh, be uh, ushers to let uh, people know that you can go to this telescope and see this thing. And we're in kind of a different format where each telescope is going to feature two objects um, appropriate for each telescope. And then before the evening, we're going to have a little bit of a lecture to let people know, hey, this is what you're going to, these are the objects you're going to be able to see tonight. And then we also have a, one of our MAS members who's going to do a laser guided uh, constellation tour, which will be really neat. And then there will be, we'll have like eight or so telescopes with two objects each, uh, uh, focusing on uh, two different objects that are appropriate for the light polluted conditions and their equipment. Jeff, it sounds like you had a question. Do the telescope operators get cocktails? 
Dude, the question, do the telescope <laughs> operators get cocktails? We had a meeting with Monona Terrace on Wednesday, and I'm sorry I didn't ask them that. <laughs> yeah, but I will tell you that the uh, price of admission, according to this, actually includes a, a uh, cocktail. All right. Mm -hmm. It's based at $20 admission. Uh, anyway, there'll, admission. there'll be details posted on the, Mad the, on the Monona Terrace website, and Kevin's pointing out that, yeah, there will be a if there should be a cocktail included with the ticket. The Twig ticket is going to be $20 each for each paying adult, and this is adults only. And $10 of each ticket will go to Madison, Astro uh, Madison Astronomical Society's uh, charitable fund, which uh, I think we're going to cap this at 100 tickets, which means that we have the potential to raise up to $1,000 for the club. So any of you out there who have a a pair of binoculars that's really good at looking for, at very large star clusters, uh, smaller or medium-sized telescopes that are very good looking, you know, good at looking for star clusters and binary stars. Um, I think I've got a setup that'll be good for uh, I, I, where I've in the past have been able to look at uh, a couple of brighter galaxies like the Pinwheel Galaxy and so Cigar Galaxy, even when there's a full moon out. Uh, with my 14-inch Cassegrain, and we're going to have a couple of larger dots out there to kind of cover with light pollution filters uh, our ability to be able to see some de deep sky objects. Yes, sir. I was wondering how many telescopes do you need out there? We are targeting eight, which is not as much as usual. We are targeting, we've got a, sh a list of targets that should work well for this event. Um, we've got a couple of volunteers already that are going to be doing electron electronically assisted video observing. Um, so I think we've got a couple of the, you know, like the Dumbbell Nebula and the Ring Nebula covered on a setup like that. And we've got another volunteer that's going to be looking very wide uh, wide view at the North, uh, North, American. No, North American Nebula, which will be really neat. And then um, any of you out there that have like O2 filters or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, hydrogen, what's the version of hydrogen that can be seen visibly, I forget. <laughs> but any kind of filters like that that help take away the light pollution. And I think for my setup, you know, you, I, the more in a situation like this, you need more aperture too to pull something like that off. Um, does anybody have any questions on? Yeah, what, uh, Lawrence, I had previously said we were going to do a possible sale or a Oh, yes, thanks for reminding me. But and, we're not going to do that. It, uh, Kevin just pointed out to me in the most recent announcements I set out on this, we did make an allusion to maybe having a print sale that could raise funds for Madison Ast Astronomical Society. However, after discussing this with Monona Terrace, they pointed out that there are some questions that we would need to figure out and that we're kind of a little bit too far behind the eight ball to work out all the details for doing this. So, to be clear, we are not going to do a silent auction or a charity sale of uh, member-contributed artwork. Is there any other? Are there any other questions regarding cocktails in the cosmos? Again, that will be on Friday, July twenty-first, and at starting at nine p.m. And there will be there will not be a rain date. So be sure uh, to contact me if you're interested in volunteering. Just don't not contact me and then show up, you please be sure to contact me so we can coordinate with you and let you know what, you know what to do or what objects to point your telescope at. Very good. Um, so I think uh, that covers everything as far as announcements that I wanted to cover tonight. Um, is there anybody here who has never visited Mas Madison Astronomical Society before? Or is everybody... Uh, Hung out with us before. Oh yeah. Well, we'll get to, we'll get to you. That's our guest presenter for tonight. We'll get to you later. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, also, is there any exciting or interesting astronomy-related news that anybody would like to share? Make sure you saw some fireballs last night. Oh, I I saw that on Facebook. Uh, Kevin and Carol Santulas saw a couple of very impressive what were they orange colored fireballs yeah. that no, I mean, she, 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 she went right in and recorded them uh, 
to see if anybody else saw that too. Yeah, I, and so, so, so if you see things like that, that there is there. I from you know, remember right, there is a service that you can report yeah, to as far like as meteors or something like that. I, 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 we can put it out there. And I, I think if you look at um, uh, Carol's post from last night, she actually mentions the site where you can post it. So this is one of those reminders that if you happen to be on Facebook, and I understand why lots of folks are, but if you happen to be on Facebook, please join our Madison Astronomical Society Facebook page because, as Kevin just pointed out, uh, Carol put up a report on the fireballs that she saw, and I also believe a link that uh, indicated which service she reported those to. So. Are, are you sure it wasn't part of the invasion fleet that they were supposed to have the 10-foot alien walking around? <laughs> you did not see any Chinese characters on the balloon set. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not hear f from any theme music from the infamous War of the Worlds broadcast uh, from the, what was it, the late 30s or whatever with Orson Welles. Oh, yes, Jeff. Uh, this past weekend, I was fortunate to be able to capture um, video of an ISS transit across the sun. Oh, yeah. And cool. the funniest thing was the center line literally went right over my house. So I just set up my scope outside in my backyard, and there was a perfect dead center solar ISS transit. It was nuts. Yeah, and did, yeah. uh, Jeff, did you happen to post photos of that up on yeah, Facebook? Yeah, I got the video on the Facebook page. So, so now here's another shameless yeah. plug for the Facebook page. <laughs> Jeff is reminding us that he had... All he had to do was go to his backyard this last week and film the International Space Station transiting across the sun, mm -hmm. and he got a really neat video of it. And I also believe another one of our members, uh, oh, Tanner, 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 yeah. Tanner mm -hmm. also uh, captured some pictures of it. So great work from our amateur astronomers this week and really coming. Because if you've ever uh, been a longtime member, I think Jeff who's here tonight did a presentation a while back about what you can do to film the International Space Station either transiting the sun or the moon. And Jeff, the last time, didn't you see it transiting the moon? Yes, yeah, yeah, that was awesome. An illuminated transit, so it was, you could just follow it as it was approaching and then it just went right in front. So it was a fully yeah. illuminated transit. Yeah, it was great. And it was a great presentation, so. It's one of the fun things you can learn how to do here if you uh, <coughs> visit us every month at our Madison Astronomical Society meetings. I oh, yes, you're good. I was going to say, I think what really would make news is if it approached the limb of the moon and then disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> 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 a video of that. If you want to catch a video of the space station going behind the moon, yeah. that would be, that'd be a shock. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe something that kind of teller pulled off something like that. Is there any other exciting astronomy related news? Oh, my question. Uh, I just saw something on, on the internet a couple of days ago saying there is uh, another solar eclipse that's happening in, in the fall. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it was it's a day day day. eclipse. It's 24 April. Well, no, no, this is another one that's no, supposed to be in October. Oh, you're yeah. talking about yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's an annual eclipse, yeah. and it doesn't cover as much as the country, but I, I only just heard of that. And I heard yeah, you'd have to drive some to see that one. Yeah. Yeah, well, right, it's, and it's like Texas is, looks like a good place for Mexico. <laughs> or, or Mexico, yeah. 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 Mexico, yeah. 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 <laughs> South America, too. You, you don't need to see, you just take some drugs and then you can... You well, it'll be right. partial here. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen a partial solar eclipse, even in Wisconsin, just because of the bad luck with clouds and things. Mm -hmm. And smoke. And smoke going oh, yeah. on. When is this smoke supposed to go away? I, I think we're supposed to get a break with the rain. Uh, it's supposed to help, I think, this weekend. Yeah, um, you know, we're all crossing our fingers that the smoke goes away soon and maybe the rain this weekend will help. Yes, sir. I was just going to say that um, you've seen the pictures of New York mm -hmm. under the smog. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I was in service out in New Jersey, that's actually what it looked like because that was before mm -hmm. the ecological movement happened, before Earth Day happened. And it looked exactly like that back in the late 60s. Oh, that was the killer, the infamous killer smog. Well, it was York pretty much like that all summer long. It was all, all, all summer long of just red, uh, yucky, murky skies. Yellow. And yellow, yellow. You're telling me that wasn't Mars and the Martian civilization? Uh, uh, maybe we were recovering from the invasion. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I wasn't the only one that saw those pictures from New York City this week and got kind of an eerie sensation that we were looking at a um, picture on Mars with all sorts of 
buildings and things. Yeah, my my sister was in New York City and didn't see anything at all. It was <laughs> to her, it was very, still very clear. But, huh. Well, all right. I see that it is seven thirty. Uh, John, would you like to introduce tonight's uh, guest speaker, please? Thank you. Um, you can see Duncan's first slide up there with his introduction. Um, Duncan Carl Smith uh, is in the Department of Physics, and he spent most of his career in elementary particle physics, uh, working at the Tevatron Fermilab, mm -hmm. and also had an instrument or had his hand in an instrument at uh, the Large Hadron Collider. And he's done many other things we too. More recently, Duncan has been focusing on um, really innovative educational stuff, and um, I had like an email exchange with him that lasted a couple of weeks. And I couldn't keep up with the ideas that he kept on tossing out of things that he's done with students and things that he wants to do with his students. And I think that he's going to just present a bunch of those ideas tonight, many of which might include some, some kind of you know, backyard research things that some of our club members may be very interested in. So please welcome Duncan Carlson. Bear with me, you can give him, or this has the belt clip on it if you want a belt clip or if you want. You can just it yeah, on. It's you just turn it on and be wary out of the microphone. There you go. And it'll, it might take us a moment to uh, trying to reestablish the, the camera picture on the live video feed. Can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hi, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we'll hang out a moment just because yeah, we're trying to get the live feed going sure. up again. I'll let you know how it goes. Mm. As Duncan and I were talking before the meeting, he, he asked about our observatory and expressed interest in uh, seeing YRS sometimes. So I told Duncan we would give him an invite to come out and observe with the glove next clear night. Just a reminder for those of us who are online, um, yeah, we're just trying to get the live feed back to normal here, so please stand by. Yeah. <clears throat> Duncan should understand, it's a little quirky. Uh, and in response to the question about the eclipse, uh, I, I, I just didn't show up. Pardon? Your name? Jay. Jay. Uh, we have three MAS meetings devoted to the eclipses in the coming months. Oh, okay. Um, I know September for sure, before the annular, yeah. and then March before the total. And there's another one too. Maybe just two meetings. But anyway, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about it here at the meeting soon. Okay, Stay great. You know yeah. I wasn't sure if it is real because I only have tried to pull that out of the internet. So some, 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 some of us are going to Texas to see that. Oh, it is. So it's yeah. picking it up there. Should pick it up here. All right. Plugged in. Oh, it's we're plugged into the yeah we're plugged into the radio. This is the input end, and this is the two output ends on this side. Okay. It was working. I'm going to put the camera on both him and the screen. Yeah, I'll be yeah. going back to my home now because that's yeah. passes yeah. directly the over the screen. Indiana, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's okay. Yeah, that, sounds, that sounds good. That's the one next year. Yeah. That's yeah. the one April 8th. Yeah, yeah. that one's. Uh, All right, okay. So, over over four state cameras. I've got to make sure that we're not yeah. stretching yeah. out. Just so you know, we're going to have the camera angled up both yeah, you on the screen second here so that people online can watch out so we don't stretch it out too much. And then we'll be You're good where you're at, I think. All right. Uh, it's used by the And that's the town that got wiped out by a tornado. 75% yeah. of the town was destroyed. And that was about a you know, year after the so it wasn't particularly good. The eclipse is due for the disaster. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Hey, I should go back to my hometown just to see it one last time. There we go. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. All right. You can always fire it. It'll still be. Okay. I got a question for you. Yeah. I guess we will read. have a gift for you. Can you get a teacher? Yeah. I mean, I found it would be interesting because the first thing that happened is the cricket started at local baseball. As soon as it went dark, we also have a coffee mug. <laughs> I know. Like 27 T's was out in the grass and yeah. the okay. plains. <laughs> and <laughs> the plows had the same problem. So little towns with like eight houses, ten houses, some down the trees. Oh, really? The good. totality yep. came in. Just huge flocks of right. birds panicking, coming up out of the uh, prairie. Coming out All right, I guess we're ready to go. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for Chaos. having me uh, and listening to my probably too long talk. <laughs> This question. I mean, feel free to ask questions. Just don't let me get started answering them. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, so I'm going to tell you about some innovations uh, in teaching, which has been my focus. Uh, I think you had the introduction of work that spent most of my career in high energy particle physics at the Tevatron, and uh, I worked on the Summit Ella Super Collider. So some of you may remember. Um, and Saturn and when. So I think we found the top quark and the Higgs boson and <coughs> nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. <coughs> so, I, I'm really passionate about this stuff. That's why I'm really coming here. You know what's the motivation? Times change, teaching should too. Enough said, right? <laughs> uh, so, I'm going to start out with a little experiment for you all, which I do with my students. Go ahead and they will cover one of your eyes. Do, can you walk around? Can you navigate? Mm -hmm. You're fine, right? So what's up with all that about they teach about binocular vision? You're going to have that to see in 3D. You know, that's nonsense, right? <laughs> so how's that work? Um, and there are these things. I don't know, how many of you have tried one of these? mobile phone ruler apps. They're awesome, right? You just point in and measure stuff. How does that work? Uh, the same kind of problem, actually. So here's a computer vision lab that I start my students off with. Week one, um, what's entailed? So you know, an optical system projects points in a 3D world to a 2D world, right, which is the image. Uh, and so, you know, the relationship between points depends on your point of view, uh, both your, call it pose, so where you are and what's your orientation. So if you image, you know, some known points, um, you can work backwards and deduce where you are relative to those, those things, right? So I know, I see all you, identify these little points, and I know where I am relative to you. In general, this is a really highly over-constrained problem if you have a lot of points that you know, like more than three. <laughs> so if I have, you know, a bazillion points, um, it's a highly constrained problem uh, to solve for your pose relative to the points. Uh, you need to solve maybe thousands of linear equations, minimize that. Well, a computer can do that. Not a student, not me, but a computer. Trivially now. So what's this got to do with astronomy? Uh, it's really just stellar astronomy parallax. Yeah. Uh, on steroids. Right, you know. <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, so you know, finding the parallax of a single, taking two views from different sides of our orbit is trivial compared to what I'm talking about, which I want to know everything. Uh, That's sort of like a, <laughs> right? I want to know where everything is, right, relative. So, you know, these things all fit together uh, and fit with, I think, your interest. And autonomous vehicle navigation is also an application, and I hope many of our physics students are going to get in there, right? It's still not really working very well, but that involves computer vision and all these, a lot of technology. So the steps of this laboratory are, you know, print a reference object and, and also learn to use something called a caliper, which um, and learn a lot about images and their formats and how to segment things through looking at color and learn about colors and different color systems and, of course, object verification techniques. Along the way, so they, they just take multiple images 
but they're mobile phones of uh, reference objects that they calibrated with a caliper uh, and, and reconstruct things. Along the way, they fit for they calibrate their phone camera because the phone camera has optical distortions on the outside at the one percent level. Well, that all falls out of fitting. Right? So you get that. So you can calibrate your mobile phone camera that way. Plus, now that you got this, you can go out and find stuff. <laughs> Fun stuff, right? So that's sort of what it looks like in practice. I haven't printed out a fancy ruler for fun. Um, and they do, you know, color segmentation. Here they are taking images of a reference object, which is just a grid. Um, and to understand the grid and how accurate it is, that's an interesting problem. How good is a printer anyway? You know, DPI, blah, blah, blah. Um, a lot of technology to understand. In, in that lab, which I'm going to tell you about, this is actually, this lab comes from an exercise in MATLAB. We just turn the key. And I'll show you how to get to it. You can just download it and try it yourself at home. Um, and this is an environment, um, uh, well, I won't go into everything. You can kind of see, you know, here I'm just using my computer laptop to be a reference object. This thing is amazing. <laughs> in fact, it's used to calibrate cameras now. It's one of the most accurate things we have around on of these display screens. Yeah. And you can see it's finding stuff. It finds all those grid points there, you know, thousand of them. And uh, once you know where you are relative to that, you can you know, put things that you can see in the image, like <coughs> pennies, and locate them to better than human vision. That's cool. Yeah. So, subpixel accuracy for thousands of images. Well, then you can go count stuff. <laughs> all right, that's fun. So you can take this technology and you know, fun uh, count, you know, birds, or, or how about stars, you can do that. So, welcome to Physics 247, that's, that's week one, <laughs> the first lab of introductory physics that I was teaching in physics in 2019. And these kids are right out of high school. Uh, what did they learn? They learned geometry is empirical science. We have a model in our head to map this experience of 2D into what we call geometry. And we use Euclid's theory, which is long, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Better said, it's approximate. And they learn all kinds of really cool computer vision schools, week one. So um, what do you think week two is about? Uh, week two is a traditional lab, you know, measuring little g. So, um, but it's amped up a little bit. So we have a spark generator, an object with a little ticker tape, and the spark generator puts you know little marks in the spark in the tape. As you can see, they're minuscule. It really helps to use your mobile phone to magnify those to measure those accurately. <laughs> okay, I have kids use their mobile phones always, no matter what they're doing. Now, what I'm going to tell you about is not that, and there's codes and stuff that fit in the data, blah, blah, blah. The interesting part of this experiment is the spark generator. That's the most interesting thing. What the heck is that? Um, and the knob is, you know, not one triggered at line frequency, right? But, so let me ask you, how many of you know whether line frequency is 60 hertz or 59? Or what? Does anyone know? Nominally 60. Yeah, but plus or minus what? <laughs> right, this matters for this experiment because every tick is at one cycle, right? So to know the times in measure G, you need to know that, mm -hmm. right? So hitherto, it's always been assumed it was 60 exactly, but is that really true? I haven't met a physicist who can answer that question. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, what's the mean variance? Well, we can measure that from the sparks. So the students record the sparks with their mobile phones. And then we drag that into MATLAB. That's what the, you know, what a, you can see a time in seconds, that's the audio signal, right? It's 400,000 samples, because it's 40 kilohertz, right? That's a lot of data. And that, you know, more than like the tick, tick, tick down the tape, right? So, but with a computer, they can crunch an arbitrary amount of data. This, you know, crunching this, plotting this takes zero time. 
right? If you blow it up and blow it up and blow it up, you know, you start seeing the individual sparks there. Um, so um, this little piece of code finds every peak and locates them all. And, and you can drill in further and look at the spark in detail. It's an N wave. It's an acoustic pulse. It's lightning <laughs> in miniature, and you're hearing the thunder, right? But you're hearing it up close, so the high frequencies are right there. If you go far away, it would sound like thunder, because right? the high frequencies get attenuated in the atmosphere. So they can, you know, measure all the times between and get the time and the error all the time. Uh, well, maybe I'll just say the answer. It's 60. This country spends several, what is the figure? It's like $50 million to regulate the line frequency. The reason is we still have line frequency clocks, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it used to really matter. Now we all have, you know, this stuff, but we're still pouring money into the <laughs> line frequency. <coughs> it's kind of nutty. But you know, the line frequency actually depends on where you are. So they have to be booted all the time. That means that when you hear the hum on a mobile phone recording of a fan, you can get the local line frequency. And it's variation. And you can tell where that mobile phone recording is made. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> and that's actually used in legal pursuit. The big point here is that the noise is more interesting than the signal. Who cares about little g? Right. Let's, and the noise is only something you haven't understood yet. Right. That's the real message. Just like the cosmic CMB was found as radio noise, right? You weren't looking for that. <laughs> Plus, you can launch a company doing this if you want, which I encourage students to do. Yeah. So what have we learned? Uh, errors, things called errors, we should call them uncertainties, are important, in fact, maybe even more important than you look at. <laughs> uh, and you know how to generate and analyze audio, and that goes with my impressions. Um, I've got a question. What's an N wave? I hadn't, I've never Oh, it's just a, the name for this shape that you get oh, okay. when you get an acoustic pulse, when you pop a balloon, you know, it's an impulse. And the, when you have a calm or spark and it heats locally, boom, it makes a shock. That has this kind of character. So they call it N-waves. Um, well, here's another thing you can do, which is really fun with your phone, is measure G, just with your phone. Um, so how do you do it? Create and save a sound. You know, in that lab you can generate any sound you want. And save it uh, and put it on your palm. Let's call that your source and play it while you record the sound with your laptop or your partner's phone. And then you drop the phone and it accelerates. Right? <coughs> so the frequency goes up if it's a tone thing, like I said, it's a sine wave. So you get a, a Doppler effect, right? So if you can measure the frequency change, you get V versus time and that gives you G, right? You can also do this kind of experiment. And this actually works really well. Just take your phone and hang it from its charging cable and swing it just at this kind of speed and listen to it. That's a very small Doppler effect, right? Because the speed of sound is 343 meters per second, right? And this is going like one, right? So you're looking for a fraction of a percent frequency change, but you can take as much data as you want at 40 kilohertz, right? And measure the pendulum frequency that way. It doesn't pump. So that's, uh, I've done that lab with the students. This shows you kind of what the data looks like if you do this. Um, this is a, there's a lot, of, I can, I could talk for an hour about the Doppler effect. There's a lot of nonsense out there. Um, this is actually a good calculation. It actually depends on whether you drop it this way or you drop source or receiver, unlike what you learned in school. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, you get the data and you can Fourier analyze it and, you know, plot frequency versus time and bins and fit that to get little g, for example. Um, there's a fancier way I figured out how to do it, something called Hilbert transform. It's a really awesome <laughs> mathematical trick. Uh, <coughs> anyway, that's fun. So 
what are we learning here? Um, in this experiment, you can learn in that, you know, a lot about source versus receiver in motion and, and a lot of math and stuff. Um, what we're really learning by adding computation is you gotta add models. You gotta model a thing. <laughs> you know, no model, no nothing. Right? You're not doing science unless you compare to a model. Maybe the model was simple, like, well, guy told me it was 60 hertz exactly. You know, that's a model. Um, no model, no learning, and no discovery if when the model fails, which is the most important thing. Which gets into science, and you know, we gotta talk about Bayesian reasoning and about ways of knowing and stuff. Um, so I get into a lot of probability theory. And another lesson is advanced math is really cool. The things you can do. And you need to do when you are crunching big data. So go for it. Um, what's next? So, you know, we get into little g. Um, students have just learned how to process linear streams of data, audio. And that's just really fun. They love that. Right? Everyone loves audio. And then you can manipulate it, you can play sounds backwards, and people's voices, and, you know, find bird chirp, birds chirping, yada yada. Uh, where do you think you'd find such streams of data in astronomy? Mm -hmm. That would be like audio. Uh, you know, in a few weeks in we get into the Newton's theory of gravity. Uh, are there streams of gravity data? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lango, I think all of you have heard of that probably. Um, that's a lot of raw Lego data there. So uh, my students can access the public raw data. Right? That's just the audio like streams, right? That's just the the uh, <coughs> signal between the two arms, which is effectively the strain, the difference in the arm lengths of the two uh, arms of the interferometer. That's what it looks like. Um, again, so it's just like audio data. So they can do whatever they did in the audio data. I don't data. So in particular, the script that i and come to understand does things like takes Fourier transform that and shows you all the nasty peaks that come from various mechanical resonances in the system and stuff like that. And uh, in one line of MATLAB, two lines of MATLAB code, you find all the peaks, design a multi-notch filter, eat them all. Gone. <laughs> two lines of code and several milliseconds. Uh, when you do that, you get rid of all that stuff, you get this, which is about a part of 10,000 of that. And uh, superpose this on what they published for the 2017 Nobel Prize, and we get the same answer. Cool. And you can plot chirps and stuff like that. And now they've I did, I did this back in I don't know, 2018 or something, and now they have all many, many, many events, and they're all publicly available. So this this will all be upgraded, and actually MathWorks is going to feature this. Lego actually featured my script on their site because I, I went into it, it's like I really want to. Back then it's like I really want to do this. This is really cool. And then they're like, well, you can come to Paris and study our mounds of Python code. And I'm like, dude, I can do this in that lab. <laughs> Five lines of MATLAB code later. Yeah. One of the students learn. Well, they learn five lines of MATLAB code can replace mouth of Python. Um, they learn that black holes are real. They looked at them themselves, the real data. It's not just, you know, like reading Time magazine. Um, they also know where they can go for an internship. <laughs> They've already analyzed LEGO data. So go work for LEGO next summer. Uh, you know, you got Dan. And, you know, of course, all the math and tricks and data analysis and tricks. They don't understand Fourier analysis. I mean, they've never taken Fourier series of stuff that's like an immediate level. But, you know, it doesn't matter. You just like to explain it simply, and, and now you use it. And now you really understand it because you used it, right? Instead of like, yeah, yeah, the math button. This is not like audio data, but speaking of black holes, there's public data available for this, which I'm sure you're familiar with. These are the orbits of stars around Saturn. So, and that is still evolving. I just had a recent paper on it. Um, and 
this is the original. So let's go just get the, read the paper. I mean, not read the textbook, read the paper, <laughs> right? And then get the data from the paper and, and reproduce the paper, right? Because you, I gave you the tool to do it. And they're, they're like, they're first year students, two months in. Um, and they have ellipses and, you know, because they're learning about Kepler's laws and stuff. And they can just have fun. <laughs> this is actually pulled from MathWorks. So you know, a guy started founding MathWorks, he was a physicist, right? <laughs> so his little exercises for illustrating coding are things like, I'm going to show you C code, but along the way I'm going to write some code that traces back, you know, rays from a black hole, and you can super <laughs> take any image and, you know. <laughs> this is student work. And now, of course, we have real images. And that's not a chat GPT fake image. <laughs> We're going to have other fun and, you know, try to make things fun. Like I found on the internet, you know, half a million games of rock, paper, scissors. I mean, I get people interested in probability, right? Like, can I win if I play rock first? Let's look at the data at half a million <laughs> games to see if people lead with rock first, in which case I should play scissors. Paper or however it was. So anyway, what's this course? This is, a, this is the introductory physics for majors in physics, MEP, or astronomy physics. And it's automatic honors, so I really get to label it on. <laughs> Five credits. Uh, that was about 80 students. So we start at zero, we assume nothing. It's like you're right out of high school. I assume you had no physics in high school. I'm going to start with geometry, right? Uh, and trigonometry. But of course, we, we go accelerate pretty fast. And we touch everything, all the way through modern physics. Technology, astronomy, astrophysical applications, engineering, special math topics and applications. I try to tune the course for the engineer and the minded and the astronomers and everybody else. Of course, nobody really knows what they're and it's about self-efficacy. You know, do it yourself is the thing. <laughs> and, and do it hands-on. So you own it. Uh, and it's about computation. And the role of computation in science and how important it is. Question? Yeah, I was wondering, is it, in previous slides you talked about people working in groups. Is this an individual assignment or is this, are they working in groups here also? Uh, where? No, in, in 247. Oh, so they, um, well, they do all kinds of things, but uh, they do work in traditional lab groups and in a traditional lab setting most of the time. And then when they're doing a, a, like a computational lab, which are the dedicated, comp I have the computation thrown through the data collection and everything in the hands-on part. Uh, there are a couple labs which are just computation only. I'll, I'll talk about some of those. They still come to the lab and, and work in a group and have discussion and share data. And when, particularly with coding, it's important. Like, you write the code, and I'll collect the data, <laughs> and we'll trade it, <laughs> right, in a further protective way. It's also about information literacy. Read the paper, learn to use Google Scholar, and then write me a paper in LaTeX that looks nice. Professional. Right. Um, I'll show you one about outcomes. Uh, there's peer reviews, all kinds of other stuff. But it's also about direct sensory experiences. I show all kinds of de demonstrations in class. It's like you got to hear it to own it. You got to like get up there and see the cloud chamber like this far away from your nose to believe that there actually are elementary particles out there because I can see see them. You know. And see how you know how far they go and stuff, as opposed to hearing about it. It's not the same experience. And it's also about entrepreneurship. I'm really interested in getting students to launch companies because there you really own it. And the students who you know they want to launch a company, they will work like crazy, you know, because they've got a mission. Okay, let me tell you a little about the company. You know, wouldn't it be great? What makes all this? Um, as a you know, prelude, what makes all this possible is information technology. Without, you just wouldn't be able to do any of this with, you know, 15 years ago almost. 
But wouldn't it be great, you know, first, if all your course materials, text, and everything was on your mobile phone, so you could access it on a bus or in a coffee shop? Or, or wouldn't it be great if you could just, like, use your phone and book an online appointment with an instructor, one click, and discuss problems with classmates, and have rubrics for assignments, and, you know, receive audio video feedback? And it wouldn't be great if you're, you didn't have to keep track of assignments and it just like was auto-populated your phone's calendar. <laughs> you know, like the due dates, you're worrying about that. You got a to-do list. And what if your course grade just rolled up and you could see at any, any time exactly what your grade was. And if you only wanted a B, well, you know that, right? But if you wanted an A, this is what you got to do. You can do a what-if analysis. Uh, wouldn't it be great if your grades, there wasn't any curving? Yeah. <laughs> so you, what you did didn't depend on what they did, and if they cheated, it still has no impact on you. But if you cheat, you get kicked out. Um, uh, what would it be great if you could take an exam remotely? You know? uh, maybe you're sick, or you got a job care, or you're traveling to a conference because now you're an undergrad, but not you're a researcher now. Um, or you know you got to win a trophy. For Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if you know your exercises were just hyperlinked to the textbook? Yeah. You do a problem and you're like, hey, I thought it was chapter three somewhere, but boom, oh, it's right there. Okay. Think of how much time all these things would save you as a student. So you would now have time to learn <laughs> instead of time to screw around with your to-do list. Um, wouldn't it be great if the text would be read to you and your native language, and in different accents. Um, wouldn't it be great if you could have all this for 15 bucks a credit? <laughs> uh, and wouldn't it be great if, you know, as an instructor, all the student work could be reviewed and viewed on your phone, anywhere, anytime, and discussed? Uh, and if it all just happened automatically, including the grading, <laughs> pretty much, right? By the way, that's not Einstein. That's AI. So, you know, welcome to my course. Uh, the phone, the course in your pocket. This is what it looks like on my mobile phone. All right. This is Canvas app, Jeff. <laughs> All right. So, Canvas app you know, is like the course homepage and stuff you can click on, and you go into modules and it lays it out, and you can click on all your things to get to your, you know, practice and homework and discussion problems and chapters and stuff. Uh, you have an online discussion forum that's all threaded uh, and it automatically pings you when someone gives an entry, right? So you can respond right away. So our instructors respond to students. To, uh, our average time for response is 17 minutes. As opposed to like, next week, maybe I'll get back to you. <laughs> In which case you've forgotten, as this it? And you know, there's lecture slides and notes. Uh, you can have Zoom meetings. But it goes even beyond that, right? The text is all there. Uh, it's all hyperlinked. And, you know, you can get audio and so on and so forth. You know, all your homework problems are online and hyperlinked. What else we got? And, you know, you can read the news and papers and journal articles. And, and you've got MATLAB live on your phone. Oops. I skipped something. And your pre-labs are on your phone, and your labs are on your phone, and they're all interactive. Right? And your lab reporting is all interactive, and you can upload an image you take with your phone, or copy and paste a you know, graph you made with MATLAB and shove it in there. It's all digital. And you can write your article in professional format that I require on your phone with a lot of time. Well, I just condensed a lot of talk <laughs> in a few slides. Um, but this exists. It's a different world for information technology. The tech, oh my god, mm -hmm. to do this is you gotta be like a total geek. <laughs> this doesn't happen. Okay, so I but this is what I've you know occupied me for a long, long time. You gotta be a geek, you gotta be a lawyer. Um, it's a lot going on. I mean, uh, but that's just as like a physicist, you gotta be everything else too. 
Yeah. So how much of contemporary college coursework is in this style? Because I, I mean, this is new to me. I, I can't believe this. I went to college a long time ago, yeah. so there's no comparison. But is this what kids are doing in other courses besides yours? So uh, most courses have a Canvas page, and no one else is doing all this. <laughs> That's the answer, yeah. as far as I can tell. Yeah, the students are kind of blown away by it. But I'm just leveraging a lot of technology that's been built, uh, especially as, as the, we have this new Canvas uh, learning management system. But the other add-ons, I'm actually a lot responsible for getting into, uh, like Piazza and stuff. It's sort of been my doing. Um, anyway, but so this is the next. Now, as far as I believe, I mean, the MATLAB only runs on a, on a PC, from what I know. And no. No, it doesn't? The MATLAB we'll get to that. Oh. There's a new MATLAB. Oh. Yeah. So, speaking of which, <laughs> <laughs> I've been, since, you know, I was a professor kid, I wanted to teach computation, and it was always, it's like you got to get servers. And, and it's a, it's, no, can't be done. Logistically. And you know, I've so I've been looking at products over the years. Uh, this Python came up and that looked kind of but it's a mess. And then I looked at MATLAB again. And it's a new MATLAB. It wasn't MATLAB you saw <laughs> when you first saw MATLAB. It is awesome. And it's free. <laughs> free to be seen. And there are over six thousand users. Uh, powerful integrated trivial to learn. This is what the integrated development environment looks like. Um, and it has a really cool thing uh, uh, called live scripts. And they're just interactive documents. You can toss images, code, hyperlinks, anything you want in them. It'll automatically generate a table of contents for you. When I write code now, I start out and I put the title. <laughs> and I say what I'm going to do. And, you know, create it to an automatic contents to be created, and then I start, you know, step one, and then I write a line of code. And this is how you want students to write code. It's all comments. It's not code, right? It's mostly comments, explaining what they're doing. And then you get a groovy plot, and then you explain what you, conclusion you do from that, and what your next step is going to be, and then you write another line of code. And, and so your hypothesis testing, and it just guides you through that process. And Malcolm is just amazing. I'll tell you some stories. Uh, this is a quote I picked up. It's more for scientists and engineers than mathematicians and computer scientists. Sort of referencing you know, Mathematica and, uh, and uh, you know, C++ or something. It's about getting stuff done, like now. Uh, yeah. Like, you want to find a periodic gram of million values and array of y, this p spectrum y, done. And it actually makes the plot for you. It's that fast. You want to find all those peaks in an audio signal, just do peaks, you know, return peaks and locks. Find peaks, thank you, in the audio signal, done. Right? You get them all. That's how fast it is. It's not like you're doing invoking libraries of code and like figure it's like boom. Uh, fit a nonlinear fit to some function, <laughs> an arbitrary nonlinear fit to a function to data y, and one fit y f. And you have to give it some parameters. Deep learn an image data store, three lines of code. Get the image store, deep learn it, thank you, give me the answer. That's how fast it is. And you can learn this to do this too, yourselves. Uh, you know, this AI was, now I've been into AI long before it was. Um, what I, my students emulate my practice of, in the code, when it does something cool, they go, they write, thanks, MATLAB. <laughs> I could not have done that myself. Thank you. Yes? I just going to say, I took a course in, in, in um, computer vision and used MATLAB, and I loved it. And then when I stopped being a student, this was about two years ago, when I stopped being a student, I thought, hmm, it'd be kind of nice to buy this. And I stopped when the total cost of all the packages approached $10,000. Yeah, yeah. So I well, wish I'll, 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 I'll have some version of this. You'll, then you're, you'll be glad you came. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some new information. <laughs> but no, students, but for students, it's free. 
And if they go off some employer, they've got that tenure. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, most engineers are using it. So, uh, what's really brilliant about it is the documentation. It's just unbelievable. Uh, and unbelievably easy. Go off and Google, say, put in the MATLAB, anything. And, and their documentation will be the first hit. That tells you how popular it is. <laughs> you think about SAO. And they have an online, for free, you can just go in and take one MATLAB in the cloud for free and just learn it. And it's a four hour course for you called OnRamp if you want to. If you want to start at zero. And, uh, and you know, I, I, this sounds like a pitch, and just give you a kind of look and feel of what the MathWorks website looks like. It's done, you know, deep learning applications signal processing, radar, lidar, computer vision, goes on and on. It's also interoperable. So it can run Python, <laughs> and Python can actually run MATLAB. It can, you know, take a MATLAB and just seek it. What's really interesting I want to find to talk about is ChatGPT can just also do translate any code into any other. So the Python and our lab war is a little bit of history. Hmm. It's three clicks to find a long example. So I Googled MATLAB FFT. <laughs> right. And you know, I got on the Google page. Skip that. <laughs> uh, well, so you open a MATLAB FFT. FFT is your first hit. Right. Um, and that's what you know the documentation on the function. Tells you the syntax, the description. This documentation goes on and on for pages. It has examples, mm -hmm. right? Doing really cool things. Click, click, done. It's in your system. You can modify the example. So it said ChatGPT will now translate plain English into the code. Um, you don't need to learn to code anymore. You don't need to learn to code. You just need to write the comments you were writing in the live script. <laughs> and it'll auto-generate the code for you. Um, so uh, that's game-changing, and that's brand new this year. And for students, from a student point of view, that's so enabling. That's some, you know, because coding takes time. <laughs> it's the thinking. <laughs> But also, then, then you got the thinking, it's the hard part, but then you got the coding thing and grinding. Uh, you know, you don't have to do that. And I'm not coding. Uh, you can ask something like, can you MATLAB code to simulate and analyze a ballistics experiment or a, or a mobile phone Doppler shift experiment? It'll give you all the code. With comments. In German, if you want. And in Limericks. You can make all the comments in Or you can make them all so that they only start with words that begin with the letter Q. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'll give you the idea of the depth of MATLAB. I had a student, so I had a first year student who was in the class. He was really excited about stuff. He wanted to tell me about his you know, elder cousin's master's thesis in fractal antennas. I never heard of a fractal antenna. I thought about it. I was like, oh, that's, I think I kind of get it. Like, fractals, those things, they got self similar, so they got a lot of scales. So they probably like have a really interesting frequency spectrum, both in emission and absorption, like, with different wavelengths. So that's cool. That's what I guess. So I wonder, I wonder if there's MATLAB for that. <laughs> so I Google MATLAB fractal antenna. I well, you don't have to try it commercially. <laughs> but I'm telling you, Google anything. It's a function call in MATLAB. They've studied the crap out of it. They've designed all these things. You want you want a fractal gasket? Just call it a fractal gasket. <laughs> That's typical. <laughs> Another story I was doing. I love MATLAB. Learning all the stuff his first semester. So he went took a spring break, Christmas break and he just learned all of deep learning of a break. 
actually two students do this. The first one was all off like trying to put Ubuntu on his laptop and download TensorFlow from Google, and it was just like <laughs> crash and burn. I'm like, dude, it's a function call now. <laughs> so he threw all that away and he was up and running. <coughs> so he took his mobile phone, uh, this student I'm talking about previously. Mosquitoes, this one was, was ticks. He went over to the UW uh, Center for Vector Boy Disease with his own mobile phone, took images of the ticks. And then he applied deep learning. And then he scaled and he got 90% accuracy and basically displaced the postdoc whose job it is to really use it. And then he scaled up and he got all the tick pictures that were taken in the country. And did the same. Of course, the center for, this is right in the middle of the pandemic, he's working remotely <laughs> from Twin Cities. And uh, of course, the center of vector disease, no one's supposed to hire any undergraduates in this pandemic, they hired him. And he worked like a postdoc level. And I'm like, dude, you've got to launch a company with this. <laughs> People care about ticks. He's going to get Lyme's disease from that one, use the app. <laughs> um, but he didn't want to do that. He was off in a million directions and was a graduate student. I liked it. But that's, he became, in one year, a postdoc level. Because of this, two things. Doing it himself with his own phone. It's like, I can do this. And the other is technology. OK. So now we're at like week four. Or something. <laughs> we get the energy and gravity. Uh, we need a sense of scale. In particular, so circling back to you folks, you know, how much energy in, in the Earth's frame of reference, which is what matters to us, <laughs> not in the solar system frame of reference, does an Earth any O carry? And how does that compare to the largest nuclear bomb in Earth's school? Um, and you know, how do we uh, make and trust impact risk assessment? This is about error analysis. Mm. It's about science. Um, how might we mitigate it? You know, they've all seen these horror films. <laughs> like, oh, are we just going to sit on our butts or the things we could do? Um, with bombs? And that would be ironic, wouldn't it? Use a weapon of mass destruction to save yourself from natural mass destruction. <laughs> you know, it's actually a popular approach in another world. Um, mm. But get the students to think big in the face of their fears. So we have an asteroids in bombs lab. <laughs> uh, they learn about light curves, uh, how asteroid shapes can be deduced from these, as well as from stellar occultation, which some people, former members here, I'm into that. I want to do that, by the way, people myself. Um, and what is this, you know, all these things, the shapes and stuff, they're really a, a form of tomography which is used in medical science. It's the same stuff, right? like the occultations are. Um, and you know, that relates to parallax and computer vision. Right? Uh, one of the things they learn in studying you know, asteroids is um, they can do this thing of you know, rocky ones from very loose ones. And you see that in the rotation rates. So, uh, the threshold effect. So the loose thing, it spins too fast, it flies apart. If it's held together by gravity, if it's a rock, it's held by chemistry, you can spin it, you know, pretty much as fast as you want. And you see that in the, in, in the line, you see that in the data. <clears throat> Speaking of data, there's public asteroid shape data. And, you know, so they do this. So let's go get the data. And then, and then these are surface models generated from various, various you know, data collection techniques. And let's explore the shape. Um, and along the way, why don't we 3D print one of these? <laughs> like they learn what an SDL file is. So for the engineers, right, you know, they're learning practical stuff. Right? Um, now for the physicists, let's calculate the gravitational field of one. It's a little complicated. Let's assume it's constant density. Still pretty complicated, these shapes, right? That's not an analytic thing. But a computer can do that for you. So we can calculate the gravitational potential. If the next step, which I haven't implemented, is 
Okay, now the cool thing that's interesting to think about is what are the orbits? Well, they're chaotic. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. Potential. So when you launch a mission to an asteroid here and you think it's going to go around it, no. Right? This is a really hard job to try to land on something that ain't round at all. Right? Um, so they can learn about that and then go work for NASA. Yeah, it's worse than that. Uh, well, we'll come to those. Um, they also uh, can. They also access the professional uh, professional ephemeris. So I graduated JPL ephemeris and the Russian Academy of Science ephemeris and improv ephemeris from France, and they compare them. And these are basically models of the entire solar system, every object, based on all data that's ever been taken, and the stuff that now this is constantly. Updated. And it's amazing, you know, you predict where an object will be a year from now to a centimeter. <laughs> Relative to what? <laughs> Interesting. But, you know, there's some simple questions like, I don't know, I'll ask you this Does the Earth orbit the Sun or the very Sun of the Solar System? Does anyone know the answer to that? You know, the very Sun of the Solar System is not the Sun of the Sun. Right. It's Jupiter. So, which do you orbit? What's just the Earth orbit? What do you think? Very simple. All right, how many say very simple? And the rest of you, now you see you're eating your clueless. <laughs> but this is a simple question, you, you should know this! <laughs> the Earth orbits the Sun, not the very simple. Jupiter's over here pulling, but it's a pipsqueak and it's many AU away. And that matters. Yeah, the sun is moving slowly, but Jupiter's moving slowly. <laughs> so the sun moves slowly compared to an Earth year. We go around the sun as it moves. Near me. <laughs> right. But that's the best approximation. Very sun is not at all. That's because it's one over r squared. So, um, so anyway, you know, I'm going to answer with a real ephemeris. You can go look and see. Right? Um, we can also simulate it accurately with metal, the whole thing, um, using numerical integration. Speaking of which, now we can fly asteroids around accurately and assess asteroid impact risk ourselves. Don't have to rely on the emissions of some guy who I happen to know at Jet Propulsion Laboratory <laughs> who's responsible for all of that. We can make cool plots right, and show the Earth's hang on momentum jerking around and who's jerking who and stuff like that. And you know, yeah, how much does Jupiter actually move us around? Don't ask the astrologers. <laughs> My pet thing, you know, you got to latch onto something, and I kind of latched onto Apophis, which is a, a really interesting object. So, you know, what goes around comes around. I didn't appreciate it, I started thinking about, you know, you got two capillarian orbits, right, and they intersect, and then you have a close encounter. And the Earth's pretty big, it just keeps going. Right? But the little guy gets flung. It gets launched from the same point. So now it's in a new capillary. And this one's in, and they still intersect. Right? It's not like they got, you know, tossed, but you still, the orbits still intersect after every encounter. So that means, it's just going to happen again. Right? You have an encounter, and another, the same, you know, in Poffa's case, it's eight years, you're going to have another one. And then after that, eight years, you're going to have another one. It just keeps happening, right? So you think, oh, that's pretty grim. It's going to hit sometime, <laughs> right? If it just keeps doing that, right? Uh, so I'm interested in reproducing it. I got distracted doing other things and actually doing my own impact risk assessment. It's really tricky. 
uh, the very small effects, one of which is um, solar radiation. I don't know if you've heard of this, but you know, Apophis rotates and absorbs sunlight on one side, gives it a little push, and then it rotates around and burps up the sunlight this way. So you get thrust, neck, <laughs> right? Uh, or if it were retrograde rotating, it burnt the sunlight up this way, right? and it was slow down. <clears throat> and you know, stuff mounts up. And the hypothesis it was just two years ago, this guy I know, it came up in the uh, JPL Femoris model with the first measurement of the effect of this radiation on Apophis is observable. And um, in the encounter windows, Apophis comes by, they have these little kilometer sized things and you go through one of those, you're going to, you know, several eight years later, bam, you know that, right? And so you care at the kilometer level and the radiation effects matter at the kilometer level. So you got to know this. And they depend on how the radiation is absorbed, and how is it emitted from various angled rocks and stuff, and how does it go into the planet, which has to do with its thermal conductivity, asteroid, sorry, thermal conductivity, and then come out again if it's slow conductor, it comes out like that, right? <laughs> that means you have to know the surface structure and the bulk structure of the asteroid at the level of thermal conductivity and the angles and stuff. We don't know that. So we can't really predict this uh, factor two. But it matters. That's the problem. But you could use it to your advantage. So you got this asteroid, right? And you just fly over there and you spray paint it black. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Or you just put a big shield there, an umbrella, and you steer the damn thing at this level. I actually think this is about our only option for, for mitigating asteroid risk. So the dark mission, you all probably saw images. It's so interesting. And one of the reporters is like, you know, you messed with this thing. How do you know you didn't cause it to go and it's going to crash into the Earth? And I go, oh, no, no, no. We missed the, the moon and it's going around. Not the thing. And, but the guy was asking them, they just pat themselves in the back. But of course, they're absolutely, he was absolutely right, because it's a bound system. Right? So any injection of momentum in any part of it gets translated into the, the whole thing. Right? So he was exactly right, and they lied. And of course, the, the thing about mitigation. You know, is you got to control it because it'd be very embarrassing if you made the thing hit the Earth instead of the other thing. <laughs> Wouldn't that be bad? You'd get fired at least. <laughs> Your mind died. Uh, and the dart mission showed that that's not possible. They put this thing in, stuff rocketed it out the other side. There was recoils like Kennedy's head and it assassinated. They couldn't predict it to a factor two. That's not bad enough. So what they showed is you cannot do impact mitigation of any form, nuclear weapons, which make big spurts. You can't control it. So I think that's a problem. You think my spray paint idea is a good idea? Mm. Probably when it comes around 29, it's going to so, come so close, it's going to tidally reform. Shit. <laughs> it's going to have a whole new shape. Where's <laughs> one thing? Call Sir Ron Williams. So, yeah, there is. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move on to a few lighter topics. Where are we here? Oh, I've already got an hour. I'll hustle a little. Let's talk, have some fun. Dapple light. Try this with your mobile phone. I, I, I was watching clips in um, near Stanford. I don't know, some years back. And you know, I noticed those little elliptical things on the ground and I'm like, that is so cool. I've seen it before, you know, twenty years ago. What is that going on there? That's an you know, the pavement under some trees, right? And you're saying the partial eclipse. So those are images. I mean, what the heck? 
Anyone know what a wireless is? How many of you have seen this? Yeah, in person. So why are they there? You know, it's your fingers. It's like a pinhole camera. Exactly. <laughs> but that's weird. They're only like little tiny holes. But it is the same effect. These are images of the sun. And they're from pinholes that are like this big. <laughs> But their angular acceptance, the way up in a tree, so that angular acceptance is uh, smaller than the angle to the size of the sun. You have pinholes at arbitrary size if you have enough distance. And they're afocal, <laughs> right? So they always cast an image no matter where you are. And you know, these come from a little hole from the foliage in the tree. But I'm like, dude, if that's true, then they should be everywhere. All the time. Eclipse, no eclipses. There's not something creepy about the sun being eclipsed. Right? This is you know, my images of these are sun images of the sun going through a bush in the house. And and there's a tree behind this bush, and you can see the shadows and the branches of the tree there. And those are it's the same thing. They're everywhere. It's called dappled light in the forest. Lock of the forest, and it's just all this, they're all images of the sun. And they dance around because the pinholes are dancing around. So it's just beautiful. Uh, obviously, you know what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> right, script, and make, a, make a lab for the students, which is, you know, go out with your phone, take a video of some foliage, and we will create the dapple light you should see on the floor. So that's what that does. That's my deck. That's my tree. <laughs> right? And uh, that's just a still, but we can make videos. So very fun. And you learn a lot about <coughs> well, all kinds of things in optics and applications. Uh, it's one of the ways to image x rays. In fact, the very first way was done using pinball effectively pinhole cameras. And if you you can get rid of a thick lens completely <laughs> with a pinhole camera. Uh, there are you just put a lot of pinholes. If you get a lot of light, you get a lot of superposed images, that's where you use a computer to sew all that together. <laughs> and now you have a zero thickness lens. Cool. There are optimal ways to deploy the pinholes. And you can go in all kinds of directions with this. Here's more optics for you. Mobile phone, microscope. You can do this at home. Take a two millimeter OD glass bead. Nice and round. And just stick it on your phone with some scotch tape. And you have yourself a very powerful digital camera equivalent to $20,000 microscope. Uh, you can see the nucleus of a frog's red blood cell. It's awesome. Um, I found out about this is a PNNL smartphone microscope way back when. Um, I didn't, they didn't indicate, but this is how life was discovered. A dude managed to figure out how to make these little tiny balls and put them right in front of his eyeball. And then he looked at the bright light source. And he discovered cells, cellular life. And he made hundreds of microscopes that look like that. Uh, and, you know, sperm themselves. And discovered that that's the deal. With this, the only difference is instead of his eyeball, we put the ball in there. It's the world's simplest microscope. <laughs> now you can see this uh, on the left, these are blurry images of something which is just awesome called Baldex. These are colonies of cells and they stick together in a sphere and when they're new and they butt in and when they're newborns they're, they're inside out. And so the whole thing has to turn itself inside out. And they do. <laughs> <laughs> These creatures are just awesome, and they live in the ponds around here. I haven't found one yet, but they do. Uh, and those are some red blood cells. 
not yours. Yours don't have nuclei in them. We, frogs do. Somehow we built cells with no nuclei. I, I don't, and so they have more room for hemoglobin, I guess. I don't know how that works. I love they, biology. They, they, at the earlier stages, they have nuclei, but they lose them. Yeah, they lose them. The and, 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 but you think they still need to like make, I don't know, crack them well. you got to make proteins. I don't know. You, need, you think you need them, but we don't have them. So don't try this on your own blood. Here's a cool thing. I thought of this, actually, but it turned out it wasn't the first. So you have kind of crappy optics in the spherical ones. Yeah. But mobile phone cameras got amazing optics. 1% distortion. So, replace the bead with a mobile phone camera. Reversed. Now you can buy the mobile phone camera from Shopco for 18 bucks. And buy one, rip its infrared filter off, and just flip it over and stick it on your phone. And now you have a really high quality optics, digital color, digital microscope. Works. Works great. Uh, let me tell you about a few more things. And Try to rush into this. Uh, exoplanets, everyone's interested in. So we go get the data and do it ourselves. Uh, this is from the paper of the discovery now a few years old of the seven Earths that are over in Trappist One. And these are these are deduced from the transit data. And you know, there's the data. Now look at the scale, these are all the brightness of one. The bottom is 0.98. Well, we got a little tiny, like, these are just planets, they're not you know, changing the light level much, right? Uh, and here are all the signals, you can blow them up, you can find them all, blow them up, stack them like you would astro stack images, right? And come up with uh, mean signals from the students. Um, and so they have to do all the finding and sorting and stuff like that, it's raw, raw data. But along the way, you have to get to look at a sun, a star. And it's doing other cool stuff like that. It's flaring. <laughs> and so then you realize, oh, the stars are really dynamical. There's all kinds of star stuff I should learn <laughs> right, about this whole system, not just cool. I might be able to live there someday. And now there's lots more data of this type, which uh, and revising this to go through the whole data sets of various places. This is something. Uh, uh, this is uh, all right. So looking at data, uh, you can suck down the whole Hipparchus catalog and just have fun. Right. This little script uh, does all that. Uh, it's 118,000 only, but you know you can upgrade. Uh, as I'll show you in a second, you, know, you can go off and find clusters and things like that in the Hipparchus data. But a few lines of code. And actually on the data. Uh, so let's get back to this. This stuff was talking about. Old phone astrometry. So, you know, my new uh, iPhone 13 Pro can take a 30 second exposure. That's what Jeff does. Right? He takes a lot of little photos and he stacks them together. That's exactly what they do. I was doing this with MATLAB some years ago, and I'm like, this is really cool. But you know what? Other people are going to do this better than I, and Apple's going to buy it. I said that to myself. That's why I didn't launch company. It's like, because that's what they do. Right? And that's exactly what happened. So anyway, Apple was, you know, they registered the Tegelazi images, they sold them together. The same tricks that, uh, you know, previously were just you people doing that. So I can get a 30 second exposure and even handheld, so it corrects for the jury. Because it can register all the stars. Uh, so this is an image, this is a 12 megapixel iPhone 13, and it's got a handheld image. It doesn't translate very well. Go find all the stars in there. And uh, now plate solve. Well, exactly where I'm looking. So I send this to astronomy, you know that astronomy, the tree.net. And it looks uh, anywhere. So that's where you're looking. 
easier said than done. But, uh, <laughs> I can compare and, you know, with the stars they find and the stars I find, and but I also know uh, where I was looking. And so the students can do this. Um, and this is real. This is not an app that's got a model and it's a little off base because the magnetometer is not quite right and <laughs> points in the wrong direction. This is like, what did I actually see? With an old phone camera. This is new. If I tried this with my iPhone 7, it's like I'd be lucky to see one star. I can maybe see the moon, it's kind of blurry. You can see, you know, in this crappy image here on the iPhone, uh, <clears throat> here's a, yeah, 3,000, 3,700 stars in a 30 second iPhone image. This previous one was a one second. Uh, you can make an HR diagram out of this. You got RGB. Not only eight bits. Um, cool. Uh, you know, in a clear night, even if in a ten or thirty second exposure, you know, I can start to see it. Anyway. Here's an image I got off the internet. <laughs> this is a Google Pixel thing. You know, that's kind of a fuzzy view of the actual. 21,000 stars. That's a fifth of the entire focus catalog. In one image. So if you just wait it, you can have the whole thing. <laughs> in, one Im in one image. And I estimate he's seeing out to 99 in this thing. But there's multiple. Isn't that amazing? That's just for these. And these little things, you know, I go find the stars, and you can see what they actually look like. Stuff. I did try this out on a student. I just wrote this and tried it on teaching a different class than I. She thought it was cool. Um, <laughs> and she's cool. She's a good strong. I also want to play around with the raw data, which has 16 bits. Sorry, 12 bits. So that allows you to distinguish many more magnitudes. The magnitudes, remember, are logarithmic, and the images all get gamma compressed right, to fit in eight bits of data. But with 12 bits, you know, I'm, yeah. Uh, so I think I'm going to have more fun. And uh, you do, you don't really need a tripod. <laughs> Put your mobile phone down. You have a problem. It will only take the long exposure if you're only jiggling it. You know, if you're jiggling it, it only do one thing. For me to get 30 seconds, I have to tell it I use Siri. <laughs> Siri, take the picture, please. <laughs> and that way I don't need a tripod. I can just set it down. Okay, I'm getting close to the end. So taking a message is, uh, forget the taking a message. Go do something fun. So here's a fun thing for you to take home to do. With your mobile phone. Any bubbles. Wonderful optical phenomenon you can find in your kitchen sink. What's an any bubble? You know, a bubble, like a ball of gas in water. <laughs> an any bubble is the opposite. It's a shell of air with water inside. And you go like, that shouldn't exist. <laughs> Because why, why doesn't the, you get a shell of air and a ball of water, why doesn't the water just fall down? Surface of engine. Yeah. yeah, it's not going to keep it from falling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it down. Buoyancy. Buoyancy. Air buoyancy? Water is heavier than air. It should just fall down. So you can't have these, but they exist. Temperature inversions. And that's what they look like. And that's my kitchen sink over here with my mobile phone. I'm just, you know, it's just dishwashing stuff. So I'm looking at my sink, taking a video. Try this. It's uh, like one micron there. And as you know, when you try to move air through a small dimension, it won't go. Viscosity wins. And air just won't go. You've probably seen it's like here, you know, in the water and other things. Like you have a, a 
imagine a cube of glass and put it on a counter and there's a little water underneath, right? And it's like, yeah, and won't. <laughs> so that's what keeps the thing from falling. So these things have a lifetime of uh, up to six minutes. And the best way to make one is take a drop and drop it on the water and it plunges in, makes a cavity, sucks in air around it, and now closes and you have an angle. Um, and you know, you can make globules and other things this way shown here. So and optically they're really cool because they're perfect. Optically. Um, so try to you know what what happens with all this uh, I wonder. Uh, internships that you know B and L, I mean L L and A L A and L, yada 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 Tesla. <laughs> Students are ready to do stuff. Yeah, they learn physics too. You know, this they make plots. They, they, the bottom right is crunching coordinate data for millions, four hundred million muon stopping muon. That's in their real lab at home back at UW Madison. They'll be lucky to get thirty. <laughs> And so they can measure the one lifetime to a Nat's eyebrow with high data statistics and try to distinguish the plus from the minus. Because the new minuses go in the orbit around the nucleus. And then there's new one captured and they're gone. And they convert the nucleus. And that increases, decreases the lifetime for the pluses. So a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. So, you know, some of the students and other people say it's way too much stuff to try to learn. But then there are those who, you know, don't. That's, you know, their journal writing. They're doing, a, you know, fancy simulation and writing it up in LaTeX. They do all this cool stuff. They write these scripts themselves. They get there. And we're about to end on this. They go off and do stuff on their own. This kid took his phone and he used the magnetometer, which we had studied, and he tried to read out his whisk card and decode it. <laughs> like, and he got into all kinds of interesting things about that. It'd be cool if you could decode someone's credit card on your phone. Um, <laughs> I might, I, okay, I'm about to. Let me just leave you. Um, all these things are available at MathWorks on the MathWorks file exchange. If you Google MATLAB, Carl Smith, or you know, MATLAB file exchange. You can download all these scripts. Uh, if you go to any one of them, you'll find the download button. If you download it, you get the PDF of it executed. You also get the code. It's all free. And there are 43,000 more than that. <coughs> such things, not by me, there. Uh, now, so math works now. If you make a free account, they give you MATLAB cloud for free. Awesome. So you just go do it. Uh, and except for very specialized toolboxes. And they have a lot of things you don't need, you know, for engineers and stuff. But the basic stuff that I use, like in this process, that's included. So you can go run those codes actually that I've told you about. Just log in, go to MatWorks, make a free account, download the thing, MatLab, browse whatever, download, run. Upload it to your cloud account. If you want to run natively, on your laptop, uh, become a special student at UW. Uh, thank you. I think I'm done. Thanks so much. Duncan, on behalf of Madison Astronomical Society, I think we'd all like to thank you so much for your, your tenacious and energetic enthusiasm for teaching and. Thank you so much for giving us such an interesting presentation. And, um, I'd like to yeah. share with you, as a token of our affection, the <laughs> Madison Astronomical <laughs> Society baseball cap. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Well, everyone, thank you, audience <laughs> out there. Well, and thank you, everyone. That concludes this month's meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society, and we look forward to seeing everyone next month. Have a good night. Thank you.